This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we're certainly pleased to have you with us today from our E campus, our Hardin County campus, our Indiana campus, our Louisville campus, and certainly from our Dosca Manor campus as well. We will be starting a new series today. Uh-huh. And the series will take us through August and it is Who Moved My Cheese? Now, I'm telling you, if you don't have this little book, you might want to get it. It is not necessary for the lesson for this series, but it is good for you to have in your personal library. Now, I've told you, you need to have this book. It has, it's phenomenal. It's, you can read it probably in an hour, but what it says will last you a lifetime. So get the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Then our lesson today, Enter to Worship, Depart to Serve. And we will be talking about, during the month of August, changes. Everything must change. And to do that, I, I even got the, the new St. Stephen t-shirt on, uh, New Day, New Way. Why? Because change has come. And regardless, you can say, I'm not going to do that. But that doesn't mean that change won't come. So let's look at our lesson today. Enter to worship, depart to serve. And after studying this series, the whole entire series, uh, it is hoped that students will know how to anticipate change because change is coming. Adapt to change quickly. Notice I said quickly. Enjoy the change, but be ready to change quickly again and again and again and again. Everything must change. Well, let me tell you a little bit about this, this book. Who Moved My Cheese? It is a simple parable that reveals profound truths. And that's what a parable does. It is an amusing and enlightening story of four characters who live in a maze and look for cheese to nourish them and make them happy. Now, and cheese is a metaphor for what we want, what makes us happy in life. Somebody may want a house or a home, or somebody is more concerned about their health or financial security, or a good job, or loving relationship, or some people want recognition. What is your cheese? Spiritual peace of mind, or the church, or just freedom? And the maze that you, that you saw a picture of the maze is where you spend time looking for what you want, looking for your cheese. All of us have an idea of what our cheese is. Oh, yeah, we do. And we pursue it because we believe that it will make us happy. If we get it, we often become attached to it. And if we lose it, then we become traumatized because of the loss. Now, look at uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 9. Or uh, what woman having ten silver coins and losing one does not light a candle and sweep the house, search diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. So the coin was her cheese. It made her happy. She had 10 silver coins, and I don't blame Sister Girl. I'd be happy too with 10 silver coins, but she lost one. It did not matter that she still had nine other coins. The coin was lost. That's the main thing. It was lost, and she diligently searched 
for the corn until she found it. She didn't ask the question, how did it get to be lost? Did somebody take it? All she knew was that the corn was gone. Somebody had moved the cheese. Somebody had, or somehow or another, the cheese had disappeared. Only part of it. But she was concerned about it. Well, in this book, you'll find four characters that you need to learn to deal with. One is Sniff. That's, you know, two are kind of like mice, and two are little people. Sniff and Scurry. Now, Sniff sometimes, we may act like Sniff, or we will try and sniff out the change. Scurry, other times, we may be like Scurry. We scurry into action. And that's what we do. And the little people, the little people are called him and ha. <laughs> and that's why I tell you, this book is delightful. Him, he denies and resists change, as some of us do. And why? Because he fears it would lead to something worse. And then you have ha, who learns to adapt in time when he sees changing can lead to something better. But in time, it's not right off. So whatever part of us we choose to use, we all share something in common with the, with the, the characters in this. We need to find a way in the maze and in succeeding, it changes things. So let's look at a background for a moment. And I'm warning you, before we're looking at the background here, but we're going to work our way to this particular church that we're talking about. Now, have you ever seen a church that was dead and dying, completely lifeless? A church that was satisfied with itself. That's it, satisfied with itself. We're keeping things the way they have always been. The seven last words of a dying church is, we've never done it that way before. Well, guess what? Get out of that. A church resting on its laws and looking back at its past. Well, let me tell you, the church is not a museum for you to look back and think back about uh, whether what we used to do any time. A church begins to look back and think about what we used to do. Guess what? It's time for a change. I'm not going to take it back. I'm not taking back anything I say today because we need this. God has said enough is enough and the church needs to take a look at herself. And in fact, I'm thinking that we might end up taking a look sometimes in the future at the letters to the churches in Revelation because the church needs to change. Let me ask you a question. This is not in the lesson, but this is me. What would you do if you stepped outside right now and you saw a dinosaur? Oh! It would scare you to death, wouldn't it? But you won't worry, you don't worry about seeing a dinosaur. Why not? Where did the dinosaurs go? You somebody, I hear you, I just heard somebody say they're extinct. Yes, they are, but why are they extinct? Because they refuse to change. And your church, your Sunday school, your ministries could become a dinosaur. And cease to exist, become extinct, because you don't want to change. We've always done it this way. The first Sunday, we always wear white. The second Sunday, we always have baptism. The third Sunday, we always do communion. Well, guess what? Change. Everything must change. Young becomes old. Seasons change, people change, and here, let me tell you, you can't stop it. Let me get on back into the lesson. You've seen some churches uh, right here in this city. 
there are churches that I can think of, they were the big shot church. Everybody, I said, everybody wanted to go to that church. Everybody who thought they were somebody went to the church, but they no longer in existence. Why? Because they fail to change or notice that change was in the air. And they wanted things to remain the same. This is the way we've always done it. Well, I'm getting ready to get into next week's lesson. Too many of our churches, too many of believers are complacent. We're not living up to the commission that God has given us. John 20, 21 says, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So he's sending us. Then the last thing he said before he stepped on the heavenly made airplane and went back to glory, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go is the first thing that is that's in that and this is the great commission and the first word is go so why are you still here go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit teaching them to observe all that i have commanded you and behold i am with you always to the end of the ages. Go, he said. Now, let me say this. Anytime, if a lifeguard is on duty, he's sitting in his chair like I'm sitting in my chair. If he thinks that he heard somebody in trouble, he don't look around like, was somebody in trouble? What was that? He gets up and get ready to go. And that's what the church is called to do. Go. If we would go, if we would do church the way he said, we wouldn't have homeless sleeping out on the streets. We wouldn't have people eating out of garbage cans. If I can help somebody. God sent the pandemic, I believe, to get us out of our comfort zone. Many of us, we were, what are we we're complaining? Complaining about being in isolation. Complaining about being in hibernation. Complaining about social distancing. Wearing the mask. Taking the vaccine. But let me get back. Haven't we been practicing isolation, social distancing for years? I mean, the most segregated time for the church is when the church is in worship. Something wrong with that picture. We are more concerned. Listen to me now. We are more concerned about getting certain people in our congregation than all people in the, to the congregation. And them that got are not sharing or helping them that have not. I'm not going to take it back. I told you all that from the jump. Acts 4, 32 through 35. This is from the message. The whole congregation of believers was united as one, one heart, one mind. They didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said, that's mine and you can't have it. No, they share everything. The apostles gave powerful witness to the resurrection of the master Jesus and grace was on all of them. And so it turned out that not a person, listen to this, whew, and so it turned out that not a person among them was needy. Those who own fields or houses sold them 
Now notice, nobody told them to sell it. So, you know, we see some of these cults, they want you to get, sell your house and go work on the job, bring all the money to me. That is not about what the church is supposed to do. Those who own fields or houses sold them and bought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering of it. They offered it. It was not a requirement. What God says to give, give 10% of what, of what I've given you. God does not say, give it all back to me. The apostles then distribute it according to each person's need. So we see this congregation was united because it said one heart, one man. Then we see it was unique. They didn't even claim ownership of their own possession. Now, tell me that ain't unique. It was upright. Grace was on all of them and upholding, so they upheld one another. You see, it's an indictment against the church that people eat out of garbage cans. And we say, well, you see, they should have, uh, well, they should take that job. They should have, they should have. They could have. You remember we did that, Jesus and the disinherited, and we had pictures and showed you people walking past the homeless. And the question was asked then, suppose that you out there begging, and here come Jesus. Now you know Jesus is going to stop, and he walks right past you. So, what we're saying, there are some prominent churches in our city. You remodel your church? Well, give the pews, give the furniture to a church that is struggling. Send some of your volunteers to the West End. Yeah, I said it to help some struggling church in cleaning the building, sanitizing the building, cutting the grass, getting ready so their congregation can come back. So yours is back. What about helping somebody else? Give them technical assistance to learn how to stream their service. I mean, after all, we got the same enemy, folks. And the church is not called to come to compete. We're called to be a community. And the early church in Acts 4 is a community, not a social club. So let me talk about the church. I'm talking about the church. Our mission is the Great Commission. And the father of uh, modern management, Peter Drucker, once said, every business needs to constantly ask themselves two questions. Two questions. What is my business? And how is my business doing? If we ask those two questions of the church, the business of the church the mission of the church is the Great Commission. You see, Jesus gave the church her mission before he went back to heaven, and that is the Great Commission. And how the business is doing is judged by the Sunday school ministry. How well is it functioning? And I'm sorry to tell you today that many of our churches do not have Sunday school because your Sunday school didn't change. Now, 
I will say that here at St. Stephen, we have done a great job, a good job with Sunday school. We believe in Sunday school. But I, I'm going to go off, off of the lesson. For, well, it's still the lesson, but I'm going to tell something on myself. About, what, five, six years ago, maybe, the cheese called Sunday School was moved here at St. Stephen. And I was like him and ha, I was like, wait a minute, what happened to the cheese? How did the cheese move? Who moved it? Well, the Reverend Dr. Kevin W. Cosby moved my cheese, my cheese, the Sunday school. How did he move it? He said, we're going to do away with Sunday school books. Well, well, what are we supposed to study from? What are we supposed to? He said, the Bible will be our textbook. What about the lessons? We will write our own lessons. Say what? I mean, the cheese was moved. He started writing the lessons. And after a year, trying to balance pastor in this congregate, pastor three uh, campuses, and then also being the president of Simmons, uh, he had Dr. Ken Jobs to write the lessons. And then, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, this will work, this will work, this will work. But then all of a sudden, Ken was working more and teaching the class at the time when we supposed to be getting the lesson. He teaching at Simmons. And then Reverend Cosby said, well, you the director of Christian education, you write it. See, the cheese had moved. And now, and if my cheese was Sunday school, here's your cheese. Now what you gonna do with it? You're gonna either change, or you gonna try to go back and look for the same old cheese? Can't do it. Can't do it. And so, what, three years ago, cheese shifted again. And it shifted this time because uh, the person that you never see is always behind the camera, Sharon Bell. Here she come. Uh, Nelson, I got an idea. Mm, what's that? Why don't we start streaming the Sunday school lesson on a Wednesday? She had it already worked out. Wednesday, 1.30, you teach it, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to call it hump day. I said, okay. And guess what? When the pandemic came in, we were ahead of the curve. Why? Because she and the pastor had been sniffing scurry. I had been hemming and hawing. They were sniffing, knowing change was in the air. And now, okay, so our mission is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission said, go ye therefore. I'm going to run out of time because I had to tell that, but I want you to see your cheese will change. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the ages. So the Sunday school is the church organized and mobilized to do Great Commission work. The Great Commission is Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven. For many, it is the great omission. The church is the Lord's unlimited power. Unlimited power. He said, notice all power is given to Jesus in heaven. That means the invisible world of the heavenlies, demonic forces, everything comes under his power. And now, so the Lord's got unlimited power, and we are the Lord's unhindered people. Guess what? The Lord has an unchanging, the Lord has an unchanging program. 
He has an unchanging program. He said, now notice what he said, make disciples. And that hasn't changed for the church. We are to go out and do evangelism. But we think once we call somebody, say, I want to invite you to my church. We think we've done something. You haven't done nothing. Make disciples. Go out evangelize. That's how come new day, new way. We getting ready to do some new stuff over here. And, you know, I'm going I'm to throw it out there. If you run out and beat me to it, then okay, that's fine too. God gets the glory. We're going to do some pop-up Sunday school. We're going to pop up here, there, and everywhere. Because the church, notice, the title, enter to worship. So we enter the building to worship. Depart to serve. The serving is outside the building. I first saw that, those words, six words, when I was 12 years old, younger, when I was at the First Virginia Avenue Baptist Church under the leadership of the late Dr. R.J. Miller, and they would give us the bulletin each Sunday, and it said, enter to worship, depart to serve. And I thought, what that mean? What we worshiping? Well, what it mean? So, but I had made serve service. In other words, we have in service, we enter to have worship service, but that's not what he's talking about. Come in to worship me, and then you go out and serve me. We serve him by serving others. God to might, I wish I had more time to get you to understand this. Then we mark disciples. That's assimilate them into what we are doing. Don't leave them standing on the outside looking in. Then we mature disciples. That's discipleship. That's what we're doing today. Trying to mature. And at St. Stephen, our classes, our Sunday school classes, are organized and structured so that we can do the mission. St. Stephen's mission is to carry out the Great Commission, and each Sunday school class mission is to help St. Stephen carry out her mission to carry out the Great Commission. Woo! Teach Geneva. God the mighty. So we have prayer leaders. Keep the class in prayer for one another and the community. So we have evangelism coordinators to keep evangelism in front of the class and, and ideas of what the class can do. Mission and ministry to lead the class to go out into the community and assist the least, the last, and the lost. That's how come we're going to have pop-up classes. It won't be the first time. We popped up in nursing home carrying dinner with us. Fellowship coordinator, care coordinator, class administrator. We have these people to do the work of the church. So the point to ponder, the cheese has moved. So what are you going to do about it? How will you carry out the Great Commission? Our method may change, but our message has not. Okay. So let's take a quick look at this church at Sardis. He said, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who had the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do. You hear what he said? I know all the things you do. And that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. I'm not making this up. You can see it right there on your screen. But you're dead. Wake up! 
Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. There should never be a dead church because our Lord and Master is not dead. I find, no, we're not talking about what the community, he said, I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. That's why I love Andre Crouch's song, Take Me Back to the Place Where I First Received You. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. If the church was doing her job, then Eric Mason wouldn't have had to write a book called The Woke Church. Woke Church. Church is sleeping. Wake up. If the church did what she was supposed to do, we wouldn't have, there wouldn't be no such thing as Black Lives Matter. There wouldn't be violence in the neighborhood. There would not be people on the streets. I'm telling you. Where was it? Where was it? Yet there are some in the church, verse 4. I think I was. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not sawed their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. See, that, that's the believers. They, they walking in white don't make them right. We love to put on white. But he's saying that they doing what they supposed to do. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little secret. And my family listening, then they going to hear it. I, I know I've already told them, you know what? When it comes time for me to go, I want to be buried in white. I'm going to be ready. I would never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone, anyone, anyone who have ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the church. So this church has a reputation of life. They have all sorts of ministries, programs, activities. Other churches look up and and think they are progressive, alive, well-liked, prosperous, busy, and full of good fellowship. It has ministries for every age group and for every area of need throughout the community. The church had the services, meetings, and ministries that were needed. Well, hold on, wait, 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 wait. If they got all that going on, the point to ponder, the church was doing the very thing it was supposed to do, be doing. So what's wrong, Jesus? I mean, what's wrong? And then you ask yourself, I wonder what signs may have been present to indicate the cheese pal was running out and should have indicated to them the change was in the air. See, poof. I mean, if it's going to rain, you know, we see uh, the clouds turn different. This morning when I got up, I knew from my allergies that the air quality was bad. And guess what? So when I checked, guess what? It was bad. So wonder what signs did they miss? Are we missing that the cheese pile is getting low? Well, the reality of death. Let me just say this. Um, we're talking about this church now. Jesus is interested in a relationship and not religion. What was wrong with the church was the spirit of the people. Their spirit was not focused on Jesus Christ. 
their spirit was not focused on his cause. They were sitting in the service half asleep. And please understand, when you do that, he sees that, he knows that. Allowing their thoughts to wander about instead of hungering for the word of God. But then when our thoughts start wandering, we want to blame it on the choir, on the service. I'm telling you, they just, it was just so boring until I, my mind got to wandering. Uh-uh. That is not what worship is all about. Holding their attention and activities for the, they were holding their attention and activities for the sake of something to do. They came to church to be, to see and be seen. They were not attending and participating because it was the thing to do and because it would give them a sense. Well, let me do that again. They were attending and participating because it was the thing to do and because it gave them a sense of religious security. That's why it gets on my nerves at voting time. And here come the politicians. One little time in the service. Well, why were you? Oh, two, three, four years long. In the West End, you can't even go and have a decent, you, you got nowhere to eat. How come? The poorest zip code in the state of Kentucky has the highest gas. How come? And then you want to come up in here, up into the church building when I'm trying to worship God and say, vote for me. This church didn't want to do evangelism. They needed to recall, remember, rethink why they and the church were on earth. They need to recall, remember, rethink what their calling was and why they were meeting together as a church. Jesus said it this way, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I gave you this work to go and produce fruit, fruit that would last. Then the Father will give you anything you ask for in my name. So we need a recapture of the Spirit. Remember. Remember what you received and what you heard. Remember the truth that you received. And remembering is just not thinking about something, but it involves doing something. And repent simply means a radical, a decisive change of mind. They desperately needed to confess their wrong and repent. They need to turn away from their error and turn back to God. And then let's look at the remnant of life. God always has and will always have a group of people who will stay the course. There were a few faithful believers in the church. They didn't use the church as a religious sap for their conscience. I go to church as a social activity, as a place for social and business contacts. See, some people come to church for social and business contact, as a place for fellowship alone. Yes, we fellowship. Yes, we fellow. In fact, I told you each class has a fellowship coordinator, but the class wasn't organized to fellowship. It was organized to study the word of God, and we include fellowshipping. And they do not see the church as a place to build their public image. They focus on Christ and his purpose. They are still growing spiritually and reaching out to share Christ with a needy world. 
and the faithful believer walks in victory and purity with Christ forever and ever. Enter to worship, depart to serve. I'll see you next week. Be blessed.